At the time of the Buddha, there was a king named King Pasanadi, and his wife was Queen Malika. And one day, he said to his queen, Is there anyone, Malika, that you love more than yourself? And she replied, There's no one, great king, I love more than myself. But is there for you anyone you love more than yourself? And he responded, For me also, Malika, there is no one I love more than myself. What do you think the Buddha thought about that? Hi, it's Margaret Maloney, and welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. I'm a Buddhist practitioner out here in the world, having experienced the loss of my loved ones and knowing how much my Buddhist practice helped me on my grief journey. And now, together, we have this safe space to discuss death, dying, grief, and the Buddhist teachings that help us really understand attachment, impermanence, being compassionate, being death ready, what it means to live a life so that we can have a peaceful death. Yep, it's a big topic and we're going to take it on together. Let's go. After the king and his queen had their discussion regarding whether or not there was anyone that they loved more than themselves, King Pasanadi went to the Buddha and discussed that exchange. And the Buddha responded, having gone around in all directions with the mind, there is surely no one found who has loved more than oneself. In the same way, others each love themselves. Therefore, one who cares for himself should not harm another. Welcome, my friends of the Death Dhamma podcast. Today, I am happy to introduce you to Stephen Scatini, and he has a very interesting life and background and is well acquainted with helping people with their release from suffering, and maybe as a human being has had some suffering himself. I'm going to let him tell you that. Uh, a little bit about Stephen, though. He's the author of a book called The Novice, Why I Became a Buddhist Monk, Why I Quit, and What I Learned. Also an ebook called The Art of Letting Go, which I'm going to share with you in our comments area. And definitely this gives us like relatable and achievable steps to really help us improve our mindfulness practice. And he's given a TEDx talk called The Inner Monk. And in fact, you can find him at theinnermonk.com. That is his website. And so... That's my way of introducing Stephen, but Stephen, welcome. Thank you for being here, and please embellish and add to what I have said. Hi, Margaret. Thank you for having me, and uh, to embellish, well, where do I begin? <laughs> um, I was trained as a Buddhist monk in the Tibetan tradition for eight years, so that's a very... Uh, I was in the... If you know anything about Tibetan Buddhism, you'll know there are some different schools, basically four schools back then. I was trained in the Galupa sect, which is very cerebral. A lot of study, debate, analysis. Um, so that's where I was trained. But I sort of craved much more. I was more interested in practice and actually putting it to use. So that's what took me out of the Tibetan tradition mm -hmm. and, well, back into this life where I can actually meet people like me, uh, like you, mm -hmm. uh, and speak. I don't. The problem with Buddhism is that when you're talking to other Buddhists, you tend to get stuck in that language. And, and I wanted to get out of that. I want to speak a much more general language. I want to apply what I learned <clears throat> to, to real life situations uh, uh, that anyone can relate to. And that's really what my mission has been. I love that. And maybe, and we'll discuss this a little bit more, but I want to ask a question now. Is it fair to say that this allows you to approach Buddhism and maybe we might use the word a more secular manner so that you could help someone, but they don't have to know it's Buddhism, but it's a way of helping someone. Exactly. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I'm going to start with a basic and I'm not trying to trick you or anyone who is listening, just so we all know, but I've learned that each of us, depending on where we've studied or learned or what the experiences we've had, may have a different way of describing the noble truth of suffering. Since this season, we're all about, you know, people like yourself who are helping us with the noble truth of suffering. I would like to know how you discuss the noble truth of suffering. Oh, uh, I, that's great. I appreciate that because you, you're quite right. Everyone sees it differently. For me, it's it's um, 
Yeah, you can certainly consider it a truth, but there's more to it than that. I think the reason that the Buddha brought it up is not simply to make a philosophical statement that life is suffering, a sort of a, a tenet that you have to believe in. I think he was drawing our attention to it and he's saying, look, take a look at the way the world is. Look at the way your life evolves and look at it, you know, think about this, dukkha, which we translate as suffering, but it's many other things as well. And see if you can really, if that makes sense. So basically, it's a sort of a meditative precept in the sense that I'm looking at it, I'm trying not to run away from it, because that's our tendency. When things hurt, we sort of try and get away. We try and escape, we try and avoid it. We we use that great human invention, denial, yes. to uh, supposedly get out of our suffering. But if you look look at the way you suffer, if you look at the way we struggle, then we see that that never happens. There is no escape. And that's when you start to embrace it. You realize that this is like, this is life. It is what I'm dealing with. If I'm going to achieve anything, it's within this context. So that's how I use the truth of suffering. That's very helpful. Thank you. And it, it, sometimes it's true, isn't it? I just, some of us, we just think, well, if I just ignore it, it will go away. And my experience has been that's not true. It'll just come back and it'll come back maybe stronger or differently, but it's not going to go away. And if we just don't talk about difficult things, then they won't be true. I have also found that to not be how things really work. Yes. So there's that. Can you share your experience of really coming to terms with or connecting with this truth? Because there's a time in your life where you're like, oh, this is how it is, or in your in your way of describing it, right? But there was a time in your life where like this truth really became known to you. Um, well, yeah. Well, as a monk, when I was, you know, I was ensconced in a monastery, monastic life for eight years, and um, I was constantly trying to understand this. Why? Why? What I just said now about suffering, I hadn't figured that out then. Mm -hmm. And I was trying so why why did the Buddha talk about these as truths? What, what, what's the point, you know? And I couldn't I couldn't really figure it out because my life was so good. Um, I was delighted to be where I was. I loved being a monk. I loved studying what I studied, and it all seemed rather fun. Then I hit the brick wall, and I realized that uh, as much as I loved what the Buddha had to say, I felt at that point, for all sorts of reasons, that I didn't belong in that milieu anymore, and okay. I left. I left my teachers, I left mm -hmm. my friends, I left Tibetan Buddhism, I left Buddhism as such. I stopped calling myself or thinking of myself even as a Buddha. And yeah, I really started suffering at that point. <laughs> I would think because that's a big change. And so first, yeah. as I understand it in your life, one of the many changes, you made this change where you left everything behind, sold everything, went on your path to be, or well, I'll say a spiritual seeker for lack of a better term, you know, you were sent from someone who thought that your life was not in a healthy way, sent you to the Tibetans. You became a Tibetan Buddhist, and then you cut that off and left again. Yeah, well, again. that was the easy part. Oh, okay. That was uh, the easy part. So go with the hard part. Giving up everything and, and you know, what I, as far as I was concerned at the beginning, I was giving up suffering. I was giving, I'd had very bad luck, if you want to call it luck. I had very bad experiences with uh, with romance, okay, with love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to put it all behind me. And this, I thought that if I become a monk, if I become celibate, then I don't think about that stuff anymore. It won't trouble me. And that was the attitude I took into it, plus the excitement of meeting the Tibetans and learning the language and the debate. And mm -hmm. it was was it was not an unhappy experience at all okay. you know when i came out after eight years of that eight years of thinking that i was set i uh, i i i was on track i mm -hmm. had my goals i i was to use not a buddhist but a catholic metaphor a christian i was saved okay okay then at the end of that eight years when i gave it all up suddenly i wasn't saved anymore I was adrift. I was completely on my own. And I was committed to this idea of finding my own way out of it. it took me years to realize that um, I needed support. And in fact, everyone needs support. Um, we, do. we do. We're not meant to be islands. We're not meant to be alone. There are a few who can go into the forest and meditate 
by themselves, but that's not most of us, is it? And even if you do, you're going to come back. I would <laughs> hope. <laughs> that's the point. For me, yeah. that's the point, you know, to help other people. Yes. What's the feeling in the world? It's, it's You can actually do something constructively helpful for someone else. And let's talk about that. So this experience and this encounter that you've had in your life with suffering, the truth of suffering and the, your actual own suffering and, you know, the leavings and the coming back and the finding yourself adrift and, and realizing that there's a need for support. How did all of that bring you to a place where you decided to help others? Well, that happened when I got support. Oh, okay. So I was, I was thrashing around in life, trying to, trying to figure things out and went through a, a, an unhappy marriage, uh -huh. uh, a little bit predictable. I came out of the monastery at the age age of 30, except that emotionally, I was basically still around 18, 19. I hadn't had any of that contact, that, that experience that, that, you know, people do in the world. Mm -hmm. So I was very immature emotionally Okay. and bad marriage. But eventually I met somebody, Caroline, my present wife, yeah. who she, she was just, just the right person at the right time. And until that point, people had sort of said to me, well, oh, you're a Buddhist monk. Wow, that's amazing. That's mm -hmm. an what an amazing thing to do. Wow, that's, tell me about it. That's not what Caroline did. She said, you were a Buddhist monk? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and why, share with us a little bit about her perspective, if you will. Well, I mean, it makes total sense, of course. I mean, why do you throw everything away? I mean, I grew up in a middle-class family in England. I had, I was privileged in many ways. Mm -hmm. I wasn't wealthy, but we were, you know, why would you give it all up? Why would you go and live with, with people who don't even speak the same language as you? And it's a, that's the first time I, I, I considered that as a legitimate question. And it, it totally shifted my attitude. And that was the beginning of a conversation that is still going on. Where we, the conversation I have with my wife is really transformative. She's a life coach. She's a personal life coach. Mm -hmm. um, and she's, she's, she studied it and she learned it. But she was actually, she's a natural born coach. Okay. So she was interested in my motivations. Why did I do that? How did I come to that? And so with that support, I was able to explore myself much more effectively. I was quite shocked. And I, I said, you know, it's, 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 thank you. It's nice to have a little support. She looked at me as if I was insane. She said, everybody needs support. Don't you know that? <laughs> well, I know I don't. Thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Oh, no, she, she sounds amazing. And you still, you two still work together, right? And yeah, very much so. Yeah. That's lovely. That is so nice. Yeah, yeah, I think that's 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 amazing. Okay, in in what way do you feel like you work in the world now to help the rest of us with our suffering? Well, well, when I met Caroline uh, shortly afterwards in two thousand and three, I started teaching again because uh, I was trained as a teacher and I did teach as a monk, but mm -hmm. uh, I turned away from that. So in 2003, I started up again. Um, uh, we, we started putting on workshops, called them Quiet Mind Seminars. And uh, from the first day, we put an ad in the newspaper and we, we got 40 people. Wow, um, that's amazing. That's beautiful. It was great. And from then on, I was teaching three or four courses a year, 20 years. Uh, well, until COVID. Okay. And okay. These were 10, 12 week courses. So they were so they were intermittent. We'd always get a good response. We got a great audience uh, and people were fascinated. But at the end of each course, they'd say, well, you know, what, what now? What's next? So COVID hit, all those, you know, in-person classes shut down. Mm -hmm. and we stopped for a, a year or so. And then we realized, you know what? People are getting used to this Zoom and online meetings. Maybe they'll respond. And I thought, well, yeah, but instead of just teaching these intermittent courses, let's provide something which enables people to practice regularly. What is the biggest obstacle to meditation? Mm -hmm. Is it because people don't? No. Anyone who takes the course in mindfulness loves it. They all enjoy it. But okay. the problem is doing it by yourself. So I created this space, Mindfulness Live, where I teach three times a week, Monday, okay. Wednesdays, and Fridays, at just a half an hour. But... The whole point of this, it's it's continuous. We never stop. It's so this gives people a sort of a, it, it, it's a backbone for their practice. 
they show up or they don't show up. Maybe they'll listen to the recording, but it gives the continuity. This, I think, is is what people need more than anything else, and, and that's what I'm doing. Can a person consistently just come Monday, Wednesday, or Friday um, and jump in as they see fit? Is it a planned curriculum or? No, they, well, yeah, they can come as they want. Okay. Uh, some people don't actually show up. They just listen to the download. They can't make it. They may be at work or it's not convenient. Mm -hmm. But the point is continuity. So we have 10 minutes of meditation, 10 minutes uh, discourse, and 10 minutes visualization. And it's just continuous. And the, the topic changes each week. We announce mm -hmm. it in advance. For example, this talking about how, how to cultivate real empathy. Wow. Um, so we talk about what's real empathy, what's not real empathy. Mm -hmm. What do you mean cultivate? Isn't it a natural born gift? We talk about this sort of thing. And we also do our meditation. And people have a sense of continuity. They have this this identity of themselves as I am a meditator, I do this regularly. I think that's really, really important if you want to reap the benefit of, okay. of mindfulness. The best way for them to find you on your innermonk.com website, is that the best way for them to find these sessions? Yes, definitely. Beautiful. You know, then if they join, they can join right away. Or if you want to message me, you can send me an email. And there's a contact page um, and I, I'm I'm always happy to meet anyone. There are also links where you can make appointments with me, but... Um, I'm not sure where that is on the website. That's on my email. Anyway, just write to me and I'll get back to you. And, okay. Um, so in your work, what is the most common suffering that you encounter? This might be a big question or it could be a short question, but you know, what is the most common suffering that you see in those of us maybe who come to work with you that you've, in, that you've helped? What is the most common suffering that you've encountered? Today, mm -hmm. I would say low self-esteem. <clears throat> People doubt themselves. They have no idea of their, their abilities. They, um, they put others first in a bad way. They don't look after themselves the way they should. Uh, they don't respect themselves. And they allow other people to disrespect them. Oh. This is something we feel it's very difficult for people. Relationships are really hard. They take a lot of work and a lot of attention. And most people just cave. The stronger person in the relationship has the upper hand all the time. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's, it's unusual to see a perfectly balanced relationship because it's a lot of work. True. You have to bring your conscious attention to it. It, it requires mindfulness whether you call it that or not whether you think you're a meditator or not you need to be mindful of the other person in order to pursue an honest relationship and in order to respect yourself and understand what you really need you need to pursue relationships which teach you that which show you when you're compromised when you're doing the right thing so mm -hmm. for me that's the most general suffering which everybody is going through okay and then of course the there's no end of other sufferings. <laughs> well, that's true. That is true. That's why it's kind of a broad question. But thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, so let me yeah. see if I'm understanding this. So I think what you're saying is what the one the suffering that you are encountering is when we perhaps don't value ourselves. And so we're not taking proper care of ourselves in emotional and spiritual ways. And that means in relationships. Mm -hmm. We are maybe being overpowered by a more dominant personality, and then that's leading to unhappiness in a form of suffering in relationships. Am I getting that? Yeah. The, the, the real suffering is the underlying motive, which is that they don't feel the they. It happens to me too. I'm not immune. Mm -hmm. We don't feel worthy. It's, it's a bit of a cliche, but okay. it comes up again and again in relationships and it's it's in many ways reinforced by many spiritual paths okay but the other person first don't think of yourself don't and be selfish you can also do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah don't be selfish exactly so whatever i want doesn't matter i put the other person's needs first even if that person is a narcissist and so i, I begin i enter into this dysfunctional relationship and fall on trapped in. it happens so much that makes sense. So now I'm just curious, do you ever find yourself working with the person who is the dominant one? Like, would that person ever come and say, hey, I realize that I'm overpowering people in my relationships and that they're giving up too much of themselves. And so we're not having a, a good relationship. Do, do those people ever come and work with you? That's very rare. Okay. Uh, usually the spouse asks, oh, oh, would you mind speaking to my husband or my wife or my son or my father or whoever it is? And of course, the answer is no, I can't just go and speak to them. They've got to come to me in and they've got to want to do it. Otherwise, they're not going to be open. Got that. But got that. Uh, it, it's, it, it's nice, but people in that situation generally are not, not really open. That's 
you know, self analysis. And as you've been doing this and, you know, you've been on this journey, is there a moment where you really realized that this was your path that you could really understand that you were helping others gain release from suffering? And there might be more than one moment. And I was curious if you could share that with us. Gosh, um, as you were asking that, I, my mind went to a, to a time in my life. It may not be a direct answer, but this is where my mind went. Mm -hmm. um, which was just as I was about to complete my degree at university in, in London, um, I realized where it was going to lead me. Okay. But it was a social science degree, and I probably would have ended up working for a, um, a city council or something. Um, you know, I would have been in some sort of office somewhere. And mm -hmm. the thought of it, the thought of living a conventional life, nine to five, uh, you know, um, married with mortgage, 2.4 children, that whole thing, it terrified me. Okay. And it was at that point I realized, no, I have to do something bigger than that or different from that or something more authentic than that. Because it wasn't, I'm not saying that's not an authentic career, but it wasn't for me at that point. Right. I'm not right. saying you can't help in that sort of career. Of course you can, but I couldn't. So, yeah, it was at that point that I realized, no, I have to do something different. That's the only way I'll be satisfied. And, and, and it, that's maybe because of the influence of my parents. Oh, okay. Input yeah. of your parents as in they were steering you in that direction or as they were saying, hey, are you sure this is right for you? Oh, no, neither of those things. They were not really, uh, they weren't really involved in that conversation at all, but they were both circus people. My, okay. my father was a lion, my mother was an acrobatic dancer, and it, it wasn't them, it was my image of them. What I thought of them was that they, they'd done what they wanted. They, they And I always imagined that my life would be whatever I wanted it to be, that I had the freedom to make these choices. And I made outrageous choices. Mm -hmm. I abandoned things which other people think, oh, I'm crazy, what's wrong with you? Why did you give all that up? Four years of study and all that. But I did because, yeah, that feeling that I needed to do something more, I needed to connect to myself more viscerally. Mm -hmm. Um it was a good decision because I was very disconnected from myself. I had no idea what I was doing at that age. That makes sense. That makes sense. I can picture it. And as I recall from your TEDx talk and, you know, other other materials, that that's the point where you went on your journey, right? Where you sold everything and left. Like mm -hmm. you left school, you sold things, you left and you went on your journey, ultimately meeting up with the Tibetans and, you know, the other, other things that we've discussed. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's. Yeah. I think that's the. Yeah, with them. I feel like that's a reminder to all of us to really pay attention to that that intuition, intuition, and that inner voice. And because perhaps when we don't, that can also lead us to a different form of suffering, right? Like if you had not listened, you could have you could have listened to those friends who sat you down and said, Stephen, what are you doing? You're about to graduate. You're probably just having cold feet and you're afraid of, you know, being a responsible adult in the world or whatever it was people said to you. Right. And so just stay mm -hmm. the course. You could have sat down and gone against your inner feeling. You could have gone like, yeah, they're right. And we'd be talking to a different Stephen today or maybe not at all. Right. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I might have ended up not doing this or waiting yes. until I retired before mm -hmm. I was able to give up my life to it. And uh, there was a lot of sacrifice along the way, no question, but really worth it. I have no regrets at all. There you go. There you go. Now, you know, two different mm -hmm. teachers have said to me, you can't give what you don't have, meaning, you know, keep up your reserves. So how do you maintain your reserves? How do you find a way to act with equanimity? Because you're helping people who are experiencing suffering and so how are you, like I said, keeping up your reserves so that you can keep doing this with us? Well, um, I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, my life is is very rich. Um, mm -hmm. My relationship with my wife, Caroline, is, is very important. And we literally live together, work together. Um, we both have offices in the same house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we moved into this house, we built the house we're in now because we couldn't find a place with separate offices. So we built a house with two offices. And we were terrified. So what's oh, this going to do to our relationship? 24-7? Are we crazy? <laughs> and um, it not only worked, I, we, it, it's it's fantastic. It's, I mean, it's not perfect. You know, we we get on each other's nerves. Well, you are <laughs> human. Irritable. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're human. Right? We're both um, human. Ultimately. Yes. And nothing, nothing gets brushed under the carpet. We're both completely committed to this path of self-examination. Um, and that's really, I think, where the strength comes from, because nothing lingers, nothing gets stuck in your psyche. Mm -hmm. uh, we work things out. Yeah, each time you work something out, you grow a little bit, right? I mean, sure. that's how we learn. Yes. You, learn, you don't learn from books and teachers. You learn from falling flat on your face. That's the stuff that really counts. I... So we do that together. Yes. Having fallen down and, you know, smacked my nose against the ground a few times, I completely agree with you. And I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wonderful that you can go to one another. I'm going to use a term for refuge in in a way together in this world. Mm -hmm. And and that is beautiful. And sure. And again, maybe even in that scenario, there were people who said to the two of you, oh, you know, don't do that. Like I can remember time in my life when uh, my late husband and I were both going to work at home together and my friends were like, oh my gosh, are you going to be okay? And I'm thinking like, why wouldn't I be okay? But it just shows you, you know, every, all our lives and relationships are different. So that's, a, that's a lovely thing. Do you have some tips for the rest of us to help us with our, you know, keeping our uh, charge, keeping our, our reserves? What kind of tips can you offer to us, us the rest of us to help you know, balance against the suffering that we encounter in ourselves and others in this world. Don't undervalue yourself. Ah, okay. It's okay. easy to say, I know, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and then it's very hard to do. But that's that's the rule of thumb, basically. I think everything that the Buddha was doing, uh, he I don't think he was trying to create a belief system. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was trying to... He's trying to teach the practical steps to understanding yourself and to and freeing yourself from, from that intense struggle. And I think the key is not to underestimate yourself, to realize that you really deserve to be happy. You're entitled to be happy. And the way to do that, mm -hmm. it's written on the old temple at Delphi, know thyself. And that's what the Buddha was all about. That's what mindfulness is all about. That's what Dharma is all about. Okay. Know yourself. Okay. And so if someone comes to you, as they do, and you can see that they're really not valuing themselves, and you want to get that person started, what might be the mm -hmm. first step on the path that you would give to someone to get them going? Uh, what I give is an ear. Oh. Um, I listen. Okay. And I, I try to ask strategic questions. This is something I learned in my debate training as, as uh, in the Tibetans, is that when somebody throws up an idea you don't agree with, you can just contradict them and say, no, you're wrong, and this is why. Or you can say, oh, okay, so if that's true, then what happens next? And, and then what happens? And so you gradually lead them into a state where they realize the consequences of their position and they contradict themselves, okay? Or they reveal something about themselves. So that's what I give is I give the, the ear and I ask the questions which lead them to realize that they're not valuing themselves. My husband treats me badly. Okay, well, why? Well, I don't know. I, I irritate him and I can understand why because I talk too much. Oh, really? Why do you talk too much? And uh -huh. so we go from there. That is so helpful. So I try and try and draw it out of them rather than imposing my ideas on them. I think that the usefulness, the helpfulness, the validation of you giving an ear can't be underestimated. So thank you for that. And I think maybe that's something we can all work to give to one another when I think possible, there's no, right? there's no greater gift. Yeah. What is it? There's, there's a saying, and I'm probably not going to get it right, but it's something along the lines of don't give a lecture to someone who needs you just to listen. So I guess we could change that into don't give a lecture to someone who needs an ear mm -hmm. based on inspired by you, inspired by you. I was just going to say, I, well, that's not an original for me. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'll just, yeah, I'll just say, uh, Let's okay. So let's say helping to revisit that concept because of our discussion. That's fair. Yeah, I won't. I won't say it's original attributed to you. You've spent this time with us, and you are very, you know, uh, wise and sharing with us and caring. What would you have liked me to ask that I didn't ask, or what is something that you want to make sure that we get to know before you and I go back to our different lives? What What is something you would like us to know, or something I haven't asked? Whoa, so many things. I would say that um, I always like to have a conversation about 
belief and okay. belief systems and the trust that we put in beliefs. The way we defer our own judgment, assuming that somebody else's judgment is superior because it's the Buddha or it's Jesus or it's 2,500 years old or whatever mm -hmm. it is. We don't take the risk of believing in ourselves, of using our own judgments. And if you use your own judgment, sometimes you're going to make mistakes, but that's where you learn. That's the whole point. But people often use belief systems to avoid doing that because all the answers are provided and the supreme guru is right there to answer your questions and you don't have to struggle. And I think that's the sort of struggle that's necessary. We need to figure ourselves out and we need to do it on our own terms. Otherwise, it's not authentic. It's not real. All right. I think that's really uh, helpful. Anything else? Is there anything else you would like us to think about? Oh, I, I know that's a yeah. such a big open-ended question, and there can be so many things. It sure is. <laughs> what, you sure know, I, guess, is. I guess you know. So going back to what you said about you know trusting our beliefs and trusting ourselves. When I say mm -hmm. that to you, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? I would say that my first step on my own path was the day that I left the monastery. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, that's how I look at it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I appreciate you being here. And I know that this is going to be of great value to all who are listening. And thank you so much for sharing, I'll say, your time and your wisdom and your brain space. It's a pleasure. Thanks for Thank you for doing this, Margaret. It's, it's a great service you're doing for people. And uh, I wish you and your listeners all the best. Thank you. I've got books for you, starting with Carpooling with Death, How Living with Death Will Make You Stronger, Wiser, and Fearless, the book that got me going and helped me to discuss going through the death of my loved ones, followed by sitting with death. Buddhist insights to help you face your fears and live a peaceful life based on season one of the Death Dhamma podcast. And just recently, Enlightenment Unleashed, how your pet can lead you to spiritual transformation because during our lifetime, we may see the rising and ceasing of many pets and we love them like they are our family. Find these on amazon.com or come see me at margaretmaloney.com. You've been listening to the Death Dhamma podcast with your host, Margaret Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. Come find me on margaretmaloney.com, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I.com. And until we meet again, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease, and may you be free from suffering. Bye for now.